preparing to live stream the webinar. <clears throat> On behalf of Agency Azaza, I, Sarah, welcome you to this online forum where youth activism in Malta will be discussed between the panel and young people. This online forum is being held as part of the Stand for Something campaign in collaboration with the European Youth Card Association. Stand for Something is an initiative which supports the Conference of the Future of Europe. The Conference on the Future of Europe is a unique and timely opportunity for European citizens to debate on Europe's challenges and priorities. No matter where you are from or what you do, this is the place to think about what your future is and what you want for the future of the European Union. May I welcome you and introduce you to the panel. We have with us Dr. Maria Pisani, who is an academic activist. She co-founded Integra Foundation in 2004 and for the past 17 years has been actively engaged on social justice issues with a particular focus on asylum seekers and refugees and racism. Maria's activism is informed by ongoing research and dialogue, a conversation that is open to change and new possibilities. Her practice is informed by a growing awareness of the fluidity of boundaries between humanity and nature, our interdependence with other humans and non-humans, and the injustices wrought by global capitalism. Maria's activism is grounded in ethical praxis that seeks to respond to the question, what are we becoming? We also have Steve Zami Tupi, a 25-year-old who lives in Zebuch. From a young age, he interested himself in environmental and current issues. During his studies at Junior College and University of Malta, he served in both student councils, KSJC and KSU. In 2018, he graduated in European studies and in 2019, he contested his local council elections as an ind independent candidate. And today is a councillor working mostly on environment and cleanliness issues in his locality. We also have with us Dr. Michael Brigoglio, who has a doctorate in sociology and is a senior lecturer at the University of Malta within the Department of, Soci of Sociology. He is one of the founders of the Malta Sociological Association, where he currently serves as public relations officer and is also a board member of Research Network 25, Social Movements of the European Sociological Association. Michael is an op-ed columnist for the Malta Independent. He has also been involved in civil society and environmental activism since the mid 90s. His activism commenced in 1994 with movement graffiti. He was a co-founder of various successful civil society initiatives, including Front Contra El Golf Course and the Yes Movement for the Introduction of Divorce. Brigulio was also a local councillor in Slema for four legislators. Chaired Alternativa Democratica, the Green Party, and contested the European parliamentary elections with the PN. Last but not least, we have Antonella Bugeia, who is a 19-year-old medical student who is also the Secretary General of LGBTI plus Gozo and the Youth Activist Representative of Malta in a year-long youth campaign for the Conference on the Future of Europe. As a singer and pianist and dancer, she uses art for self-expression and to raise awareness on important topics. She believes that we all play a role in shaping our society and hopes that she can encourage positive changes in the current sexual health, mental health and environmental situations. I would like to thank you for being so active within our community, moreover for accepting and being part of the panel for today's initiative, Youth Activism in Malta.
May I also take the opportunity to thank the young people who are here with us, either following this online forum to our social media or are here with us in the room. And I also would like to thank you for bringing forward many interesting questions which will develop today's conversation. My colleague Maria is also here with us to receive questions throughout this online forum. So feel free to comment while you are watching this live interaction. And let us get to what we are here for today, discussing youth activism in Malta. Many young people are expressing dissent towards economic, social and environmental policies and practices that contribute to life in diverse ways. But clearly, not all forms of activism have the same impact or repercussions. I would like to address you first, Michael. In your opinion, what is activism? And also your perception about activism here in Malta. Yes, there's a lot. First of all, th thanks a lot for this initiative. This is a wonderful initiative. We need more of such initiatives. So well done. Well, uh, there's a lot to say about activism. Perhaps to simplify things, we can start off by asking what is what young people are what issues young people are active in who that is which organizations young people militate in and how what type of actions do young people carry out now if we if we look at the the, the most prominent issues which have been mentioned in the media but not only in the media in the past few years we have seen the environment, for example, I conducted, I'm conducting research on protests last year, even though COVID was the main issue, the, the largest number of protests in Malta were on the environment. This seems to be an ongoing trend. Every day, the environment is on the news headlines. Uh, the murder of Daphne Caruana Galizia raised a lot of activism in the past years. Migration, I'm sure Maria, has a, Maria Pisani has a lot to say about this. Um, unfortunately, I have to say, um, that there were two types of actions on migration, some which I support, others which which I don't. To make it clear, I, I, I do not support racist initiatives. Um, and then some new issues emerged. For example, most recently, the abortion issue emerged. So sometimes it's very predict to to it's very difficult to to predict which issues will 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 be dominating the headlines. For example, when, when I co-founded the Yes to Divorce referendum with Jeffrey Pulici in Orlando and Everest Bartolo, if one had asked us uh, perhaps two years ago would, whether divorce would be introduced, I, I would be the first one to say it would be very difficult. But you know, then there was a momentum, there was a wave, and we were successful. The other question is who? Who is active? The most immediate answer to this question is NGOs. You know, graffiti is on the news headlines every day, almost. Republica is on the news headlines almost every day. Other organizations are, are, are very much in, in the news headlines. However, we have to keep in mind that there are also young people who are active in political parties. Let us not forget that. There are young people who are volunteers. Perhaps they are not. On, they, they do not hit the news headlines, they do not hold banners and placards or carry out militant action, but they volunteer on the ground and, and they, they carry out a lot of solidarity work, for example. And you also have individuals, I'm, I'm seeing Steve here, who is an independent local councillor. Last year, for those of you who, who, or a few months ago, I forgot exactly when exactly, that there was, a, he carried out a one-man action in Zabuch to protest about against certain types of development. So sometimes you, you also have individual actions. For example, the, the most celebrated example is in the past months and years was that of Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg raised consciousness on climate change much more than many scientists did, for example. I have nothing against scientists. I come from academia myself. But it's very activism is very, very important. Then we can also um, answer this question or this question regarding activism by seeing how is activism carried out. Again, the most obvious example and the one that I like researching most and I was very much active in, in the past years was is protest. You know, protests are colorful. They captured the news headlines. There are different types of protests. For example, last year we had, we had um, migrants who were, who were trapped on Captain Morgan ships 
in the middle of the sea. And as some sociologists say, the only weapon they had was to, was to you know, protest, protest on those ships because they had no other option. Some call them the weapons of the weak. But the most common type of protest usually is when you have people with a banner holding a press conference or protest at the same time. Today, Graffiti held one, for example, in St. Julian's. Um, but again, there are many other types of, 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 of activism. A sociologist Charles Tilly refers to the social movement repertoire. It's like theater, you know, it's like drama. There's a whole range of activities which you can carry out. The media is being used very much. There are some who are active very much on the social media. Now, whether that is effective or not is another something else which we can discuss later on. And again, there's a lot of activism which is hidden from the media, which is on the ground community activism carried out usually by selfless activists who are not there for the fame and the glory, but are there more to help other people. And here I'm referring to activists, not only in issues such as those which I mentioned, like the environment, but also in self-help, in illness, for example, care of the elderly, um, helping refugees, and so forth. There are so many people on the ground who are invisible, but whose contribution to society is, is, has no price, basically. It's, it's immense. You cannot find it in GDP figures, in gross domestic product figures. You just gave us quite a clear picture of how activism is diverse and how one can be involved in activism in various ways as well. Maria, in relation to what uh, Michael has just said, um, can all young people be involved in, active, in activism? And I mean, what does it really take to be an activist? And we've got a very interesting question as well here um, from George Farouja, who's here with us. Um, he's quite curious to know if Malta has a law indicating how old one should be to be engaged in activism. Is there like um, an age set to be an activist? Maria, what do you think about this? I think anyone can be an activist um, or anyone can engage in politically. And when I say politically, I mean P with a little P. Um, and I think this is where we're really focusing today, although, of course, not exclusively. Um, I don't think there's an age limit because um, I, ultimately we are political beings, no? Um, and so for me, the, the sooner somebody gets involved, the better. But, but I want to sort of bracket that or position that um, gets involved in an informed way um, because activism isn't... I didn't wake up one day and say, I want to be an activist. That, that never happened, just to be clear. And I, and I have defined myself more recently as an academic activist, which is in a sense taken on an, uh, as an identity, but it was also a political statement um, in relation to my work as, as an academic, um, that, that the, the, the knowledge, if you like, that I generate through research and through practice is informing my activism. Um, I think it was Karl Marx who said, the point is not to understand the world, the point is to change it. And it's once you have that knowledge, what are you going to do with it? So for me, activism needs to be informed. And there are as many ways that, that a young person can inform themselves, not just through academia and research, through conversations, coffee shops, wherever um, uh, we learn uh, all the time. No? And, I mean, I think this is key to youth work as well in terms of informal learning. Also the idea that I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of adding to, to what Michael said and not disagreeing with him. Honestly, I agree with absolutely everything that Michael said. People often identify activism as those protests outside. But for, for me and for the activists that I work with in, um, over the over many years now, that is generally the last resort. We, we take to the streets, literally, and, and, and I've taken to protests. Uh, I've never done one on my own, I have to say, Steve, but the, the, least, the, the smallest I did was three of us that turned up with banners and also hundreds that have turned up. But that would have been the last resort that we feel we have nothing else but to just get out there and, and to protest and ultimately to hold power to account. Um, but the work that it involves 
is so much more than that. Um, from outreach work, detached work, working with marginalized communities to reading, reading and reading in terms of policy documents, position papers, then drafting our own position papers, liaising with other NGOs and members of civil society, meetings with government and other key stakeholders. So there is so much work that, that goes into activism. I think when you take it on, um, almost quasi quasi as a lifestyle as part of, of my work in, in, in my case. Um, but obviously not everybody can contribute in that way um, and, it, and, they, and they shouldn't have to. Um, so there are many different degrees. There is a spectrum, I, I think. It's not either you are or you're not, but there are different ways of engaging. Um, and people tend to, to, at the moment, I'm withdrawing a little bit, mainly just to see where I'm at um in terms of my own learning and perhaps also just because i'm tired um, because it's exhausting uh, <laughs> it's easy to burn out um and 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 i see this happening a lot as well people come in and and move out according to what else is going on in their lives and where they're at so it's diverse evolving always you never know what's around the corner um and i think in malta different people take um for example, I've taken a position on abortion. Um, I am um, very much pro-choice. I tend to not be very active in terms of environmental issues, but I turn up for as many protests as I can. That's where I con that's my contribution. But then when it comes to asylum seekers, refugees and race, that's where I sort of really get uh, dug in. So frontline, second line and, and, and even further back. As you said, Maria, uh, there is no age limit um, mm. belonging to activism. And I must say that you and Michael are quite um, a very good example of this, because since I was very much younger, I've always seen you at the very forefront working towards things which you really believe in. And you mentioned a very important point, Maria, being informed. And I believe that Steve, is a very much informed youth activist. Steve um, lately has made um, quite of a point um, and has made headlines as well, standing on his own and sticking to and working towards what he believes in. Steve, as a youth activist, holding very much close to your heart what you believe in, that is the environment, so on and so forth, what do you believe? is the biggest challenge in youth activism at the moment. And maybe you can also tell us on how you're dealing with it because we just, we can only see what happens, but we don't know what happens afterwards, so on and so forth. Well, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to be here amongst you talking about this subject, which I think is very important we discuss it. Well, Regarding activism, you know, the, the, even the word activist, as much as I may like it, sometimes I dislike it because it sort of labels people as activists. And anyone who doesn't consider himself an activist is automatically outside of that equation and is, is, is on looking instead of getting involved. I think we, we, we all need to be vocal on the issues that, that interest us, that we are passionate on. In my case, I am very much interested in the environment, in transport, in political issues, just as Michael and also Maria mentioned issues that they are very passionate on and are obviously important in, in society. I think one of the, the, the greatest challenges and, and issues where activism and the youth is concerned is um, the, the issue of, of social media. I remember when I was at junior college, in, in 2011, 12, and, and 13, it was it was the period when when our activism, so to say, in the junior college bubble, um, was shifting from a more on the ground approach to a, a more digital one. We had the issue of, of smartphones coming in. We had newspapers and media that that were um, more traditional were shifting online. And we had this, this shift in, in the way we, we communicate our message. And as much as I see it an opportunity, social media, it, it sometimes also creates a sort of what we call a social bubble in which we limit ourselves to people that we usually share the same opinion as ours. 
and we, we lose out on what's happening on the ground. Even Maria mentioned a, a point about exhaustion and, and, and feeling tired. You know, you open up your, your smartphone, you're constantly being bombarded with so many issues and current affairs, and you suddenly feel exhausted. You feel helpless. You feel that all of a sudden, what you believe in is beyond your reach in changing, and, and you stop at that. And that obviously brings on to the, to the second point, which I think affects activism, is obviously um, apathy, which you have a lot of people that could be involved, they wish to get involved, but for some reason or another, do not get involved. And we must try to understand why and how and work how to attract more people to get involved. And I think social media is, is, is a very interesting area that we have to think about. Yet again, obviously, it has brought a lot of opportunities. If you take, for example, my, my personal experience with the local council elections, most of my campaign was done on social media. So thanks to social media, I had the opportunity to reach out to my voters and share my ideas with them. And it was very effective, but we shouldn't limit ourselves just to social media. We've seen it in the past where things go viral on social media and then we come to physical protests or, or demonstrations or discussions um, in a room or in the street and, and very few people turn up or not as much people as we would have hoped for. I get it. And how, but how do you deal about things, Steve? For example, when things don't go your way or you are um, judged or someone confronts you, how do you deal about those things? Well, from, from my limited experience, I always try to bridge out and, and communicate with everyone, even with people I may not necessarily um, agree on or have different views. I think dialogue is very important. Unfortunately, sometimes when we limit ourselves to Facebook, for example, that bridge of dialogue is broken down before we start, because there isn't that physical interaction, and we uh, one can easily assume wrongly about the other person that perhaps they've never met. Um, groundwork is very important. What we usually see on, on Facebook, and for example, in my case, is usually the last, the last best chain. So it's the, the last resort when I when I resort to, to writing about certain issues, for example, it's it's when either other methods have failed, communication with the authorities may not have moved in the direction as fast as I would have hoped for. So I I I I, I go on social media to inform people about what's happening with the with the with the hope that if enough people are are taking are, are having attention, um, things will move, so to say. In that instance, for example, when I, I, physic, I did a physical protest alone at, at that certain point in time during the day, I felt that was the last resort to, to, to make a point and, 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 and to, to, to get attention. To get attention, not to myself personally, but to what was happening on the ground in, in, in that particular area of, of my town. And uh, it works in the sense the, the media are always looking for, for opportunities to, to make stories. So I don't think anyone should be discouraged to, to make his own mini campaign or, or get involved in NGOs or, or, or voluntary groups, because there, there is a lot of work that still needs to be done. I am more than sure, Steve, that your honest uh, opinion and values shared at this point in time have been considered quite well by young activists who are still enthusiastic um, in becoming uh, more involved within our communi community. Stephanie Mikalev, uh, who's with us here in the room, has commented on how difficult it is for society to understand the value of activism and the advantages of youth participation. Antonella, you being so young and an emerging youth activist, um, what do you think are the common misconceptions people have about activism? Because we do hear a lot about activism. In your opinion, what are the common misconceptions people have about activism? 
so to be honest, I think a lot of the misconceptions have already been dealt with indirectly um, through the other panelists. However, I think one of the main ones that just constantly crops up is the fact that um, people think that to be an activist, you need to be very involved in law, you need to have studied maybe at law school or, or you know, are constantly keeping up with a lot of policies and know everything about what's going on in your country on every single different topic when that is not true. You know, you don't, there is no... A formal requirement to be an activist. You can do anything to be an activist. And I really believe that, you know, protests and things like that, they are important um, and they do bring a lot of attention to different topics. However, um, that is only kind of the tip of the iceberg when it comes to activism. Um, I, I really value art as a form of, you know, self-expression and even that can be used in activism. For example, I take part in a lot of different photo shoots or even dances sometimes, which reflect specific topics like mental health. Sometimes, you know, uh, social media is really important for you, young people. It can cause a lot of damage, but if used properly, it can be really useful. So even that, like sometimes having um, an artistic photo to represent, for example, uh, issues related to the environment or abortion or mental health, like that can also have an impact. And even the small individual actions really matter. So, for example, I'm um, a coordinator in the medical association at my for my course, and you know the activism kind of in that organization ranges from going to give talks to schools and also simply just having a discussion with another course mate about why it's important to be more involved in issues related to refugees or issues related to mental health. So it can vary a lot. So I think that's the biggest misconception really. And apart from that, it's that some people, for example, think that activism needs to be sort of violent or constantly against the government, you know, in certain protests or even what we hear from what happens abroad. But in reality, that is one kind of last resort aspect to activism. And even then, um, we, you know, as an activist, you are fueled by what you're passionate about, and that will keep you moving forward, you know, and sometimes that may collide with what the government is doing. However, I think we all realize that in order to make, you know, actual policy changes and things like that, we need to properly and kind of nicely discuss with the government. So it's, you know, activism involves being like learning how to communicate with everyone around you and learning to listen to other opinions which are different and getting new opinions and you know learning more about the world and seeing where you want to make the change and focusing on that so i think that's important so in your opinion antonella there's no fixed job description as put out there to be uh, a youth activist, in order to be a youth activist, you don't need to be violent. You can just do small things which will re um, result in changes, positive changes. You mentioned something which really struck me, and I think that anyone who would want to be, get involved in youth activism and activism itself should keep in mind, you should be fueled with what you are passionate about. Well done. I'm, I'm very happy to see that there are young people like you, emerging youth activists, who have already um, a good mindset on how to work uh, towards a better community. Just to pass on to something else, yes, uh, Stephen Bayada, um, who's a participant here during this online forum, has asked, and I quote, does social media radically change what it means to be an activist? Does it merely provide a platform? And to add to Stephen's query, I would like to ask if the online sphere will ever take over the marches that we see and the protests and people being out there, not violently. Um, Michael, maybe you would like to, to answer Stephen. Yes, I think that's a very pertinent question and even in to go back to research, as Maria was saying, a lot of research today is asking this question precisely, whether digital activism is taking 
place of physical activism and so forth. Well, I remember when I was a young 20 year old, the movement graffiti, there was no internet. We used to send faxes. We used to use my father's fax machine and we used to send faxes to the press. So they used to receive a fax with my father's name on it. I, I don't know if he, uh, till now he, he, he realized that I was using his fax, but anyway, um, it was very different. It, it, press releases took time. If we wanted to contact a foreign organization, we used to write them a letter. Then the email came, then there were the Seattle protests in 1999. And that was like a turning point <clears throat> where for the first time, NGOs all around the world started communicating with each other in real time, so to speak, via email. It wasn't chat or something, it was any, but at least it was much quicker than a letter which arrives after the protest is held, probably. Um, uh, uh, but activism was still taking place. I mean, I remember I was in the Front Contra Golf Course back then, and much of our activism was held on the ground with farmers and with other organizations, church organizations, environmental organizations, political organizations. So we formed a broad alliance on the ground. However, the social media has had a huge impact on, 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 on activism. I am neither an optimist nor a pessimist on, on, on the social media. I use it a lot. Like Steve, I am very much concerned about echo chambers. I think there are a lot of echo chambers. What is an echo chamber? An echo chamber is when you, and you just speak to people who think exactly like you. And the way how Facebook works and other platforms work, algorithms make these things much easier to happen. And like Steve as well, I very much agree with what Steve was saying. We should, we should deliberate instead. It's very good to, to speak to others whom you disagree with. You, you can learn a lot from others, even to strengthen your own ideas sometimes. Sometimes you might realize you are wrong or you have more to learn. And the, actually, the more, the more you learn, usually the more you realize that you need to learn. And I think that is very important. Now, um, on the one hand, the social media enables us or enables most of us to to be active you know some call it clicktivism or or, or five minute activism you can sign up a petition by amnesty international for example or you can send a donation to the world wildlife fund or you can ask the government to show solidarity to people who are drowning in the sea for example a lot of people carry out activism in that way on the internet on the other hand some say this is, you know, it's just, it's just theater. It, it, it doesn't have physical presence. But let me tell you something, even from my experience. I was active in, in two of the largest protests ever held in Malta. One was Front Harsin Odizet against the zone or development in 2015. And I actually wrote, wrote a paper on it. And the other one was a protest held a few days after Daphne Caruana Galizia was murdered. They were physical protests. There were many people. But without the digital aspect, without the social media, without the, the traditional media, without traditional organization, there was a whole mix of new organizations, old organizations. It was, whether one liked it or not, it was politicized because politics is everywhere. I don't think you can look at multi society and ignore politics. Politics is all over the place, from the band club to the football club, everywhere. Um, so I think that the digital and the physical interact. They need, they need each other. If you have just a physical protest, but it captures no media attention, it's useless. So a physical protest, if Steve Zamit Lupi went um, in front of that bulldozer or whatever it was a few months ago, and the media did not give it attention. Now, okay, it was on Facebook Live, but again, Facebook Live can be a bubble. I mean, sometimes it's just your friends, perhaps, or people who follow you. But then there are the, the media sometimes picks these up, and there are some media which are almost thirsty for such actions, as, as I really agree with what Steve was saying. Well, actually, I, I agree with what everyone was saying, practically. Um, so having something physical without the digital, and media is the, most of the media is digital today. I'm referring both to the traditional media and to the social media. The physical on its own is useless. So when there were migrants last year on Captain Morgan ships, because that was a protest, those were protests which really struck me a lot. And they had no other option but you know to to to, to stand up for their rights. Imagine the media did not give them any coverage. Probably, probably we wouldn't have known until today that these protests 
took place. Okay, so it, the digital and the physical interact with each other. However, um, here I think what, what Antonella said is also very important. Um, protest is, is one aspect, protesting even on Facebook or, or physically is one aspect of activism. As Maria said, it could be the last resort, often it is. However, there, there's, a, there's a lot of activism which, which takes place behind the scenes, backstage. So if, 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 if activism is a theater, a lot of activism doesn't take place on stage, it takes place backstage. For example, through lobbying. I mean, it's not, a, let's make it clear, it's not only big business who lobby, but even NGOs, perhaps some lobby for the wrong reasons, some lobby for the right reasons. Think of hunting of birds. Now, I know there are different opinions on hunting, but you have two main major organizations which keep, which lobbying, which lobby, both on a national level and, on an, and at an EU level. I'm referring to BirdLife and the Hunters Federation. Much of their lobbying is behind the scenes. Bird life hardly ever carry out any protests, but they lobby a lot behind the scenes. Culture is also very important. Um, I think, just as I mentioned political parties, you cannot look at multi-society and ignore certain cultural aspects. The band club, for example. For many people, perhaps not for everyone, I mean, I'm not a band club enthusiast myself, but when, when I campaigned even door-to-door -door house visits, and I think Steve can, can agree with me given that he is a local councillor, many people give a lot of imp importance to the band club. For them, it's their identity. And, uh, and a lot of ideas are shared at band club level. No wonder there are so many politicians who are interested in band clubs. It's, not, it's no coincidence, believe me. Um, but uh, there's another type of activism, um, which is very important. Maria referred to politics with a small p, and I agree with her that should be our focus. But let us not forget the most, perhaps one of the most effective tools of activism is the vote. Hadn't we voted to join the EU, we would never have had the EU, for example. We would never have joined the EU. Now, I'm not saying everything can be determined by the vote, okay? But the vote is another important tool, which sometimes is not given the importance it deserves. Now, having said that, politics is, is a game which is not always, you know, so nice and rosy and clean. I have to say that as well. So there are a lot of levels of activism, and I think they, they complement each other. I, I, I think we should look at the social media neither in an over-enthusiastic way nor in a pessimistic way. If somebody feels comfortable writing on Facebook to show solidarity with migrants and he feels that he is doing a big deal with that, that's fine. If somebody else wants to dedicate his life to, to solidarity with migrants, as Maria does, for example, that's fine as well. Both, both are very important. Both complement each other. They're like two sides of the same coin, in my opinion. This this conversation is turning out really, really interesting. And I would like to invite um, the other panelists if they would like to remark on something which is being discussed um, by the person I address, please feel free to do so. I mean, this is no question and answer. This is a dialogue. And this is what Europe is all about. It's about uh, creating dialogue in order to reach a consensus where communities will be able to function um, in a healthy way. And uh, yes, this conversation is developing really nicely. And I must say, and I am very proud to say as well, that the participants who are here with us in this room have come up um, with very interesting um, questions and concerns and matters to discuss, such as the one Axel shared with us. Maria, you're, here, you're still here with us. I know you're quiet, which is something which you usually you're not, but um, I would like to, to address you. Axel is asking if protests alone, led by decentralized leaders, would be enough to lead uh, to policy reform or change. Let me just repeat this because I was a bit <laughs> about it. So Axel is asking if protests alone led by decentralized leaders would be enough to lead to policy reform or change. Would you say that the association of youth activists and organizations helps to maximize the impact of their campaign? Okay. 
um, there is so much there. Uh, there are so many different issues that that I want to 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 pick on, and maybe I can sort of link them and and, and respond to 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 Axel at the same time, and and also to a, a question that came up at, that I saw in the chat versus uh, about advocacy, which I can relate um, to to the issue of citizenship. Let me start by saying that I, I agree with Michael completely that it's the big P and the little P. It, it's, it's all of it. Um, much of my activism, um, when I speak out, and others like me, because obviously I don't speak out on my own, we speak often on behalf of others that are not given the, the platform to speak. Now that comes with a massive responsibility. Um, the, the, there is always the risk of, of colonizing voices, um, which means that dialogue and listening and embracing uncomfortable conversations with people that you don't agree with are so important. I mean, this is not about shutting down conversation. Ancia Contras is the opposite. It's, let's, let's have these uncomfortable conversations and youth work is key here. Um, so this is in, in, incredibly important, I think, in terms of even um, creating democratic spaces. But democracy is exclusionary and citizenship is exclusionary. I think democracy at the moment is the best that we have, but I have major issues with it. Let me look at just what I'm working on at the moment. Well, one of the issues that I'm working on at the moment is access to the vaccines for asylum seekers and irregularly residing migrants. They don't have a vote. They will never have a vote in Malta. The vast majority of um, people who have been granted international protection in Malta have no right to become a citizen. They cannot apply for citizenship. So they are excluded from this incredibly important process. So whilst, yes, the, um, I, I call it the citizenship assumption, the assumption that everyone um, can, but, but it actually is, is very limited. So this is where I think advocacy comes in. And it also, in a sense, responds to Axel's question as well. Sometimes it can just take one end. We're talking about power here and who holds power and who has access to power. Um, who gets to speak and perhaps more importantly is who will be heard. Um, and, and sometimes it can just take one person with the right kind of power and the right voice to make a difference. But the chances are that we're not advocating on behalf of this individual. We're advocating on behalf of individuals and non-humans that do not have a voice. And here I include, of course, animals and plants and the environment and so on. So I would say it depends. Um, obviously, it stands to reason that, that much of our work cannot be achieved on our own. It's through alliances, whether it's through the arts, through youth clubs, through churches and faith groups. It is people coming together. Um, and, and I really sort of wanted to pick up on what Antonella said as well. I, I loved the title of, your, of, of, of this event. And, and perhaps one of the questions that I always ask is, what do you stand for? Because I think this is, this is where it, it starts. What do you stand for? Because if you stand for nothing, you will fall for anything. And perhaps activism um, and, and engaging politically, well, it's about hope. It's because we believe that, th that things can change and hope is a political act. And whilst I understand apathy, cynicism and apathy is, is essentially consenting to the status quo at the same time. So I think hope and, and hope as a political act is incredibly important. In the time, uh, I'm a returned migrant, but I've been living in Malta for 33 years, 34 years. So I've seen, uh, I've seen significant change. And I've also seen how, and it's also, I think, and again, I, I'm gonna use youth work here. Youth work is an ethical process. I think it is, it is about philosophy as well and, and learning and questioning. What do I stand for? And I don't think this is something that's encouraged um, in, in our education system and in broader society to actually just take a step back and think and reflect on the values that are going to guide us um, as, 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 as we become, if, if you like. Um, I think many of us, certainly generations my age, were taught what our values should be without actually thinking about it. Um, and more recently, over the last few decades, our values have essentially been 
capitalized, if you'll pardon the pun, by an economic model that is creates a dog eat dog competitive environment where everything, everything is a commodity, including human rights. We sell citizenship. We sell citizenship. International uh, beneficiaries of international protection cannot get citizenship. But if I come with lots of money, and this also responds to Axel, I can buy citizenship. So um, it's a very, very complex um, but interesting conversation that I think um, we would all benefit from engaging in. I don't know if any of the other panel members would like to either add to what Maria said or even to debate what Maria said. Okay, so I let's move. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Mike. Sure. Um, Antonella previously mentioned something, and I want to tie it to what Maria was saying. Antonella said that the arts can can get you involved in activism and and Maria mentioned having a passion for something again in in, in sociology there are so many reasons why people join join an organization sometimes it's because they have suffered themselves or have seen a family member sometimes it could be a song when i was a teenager i heard a band called rage against the machine i formed my own band and i joined and we formed movement graffiti so it was a song it was art in that sense so there are so many different motivations which can, which can um, make you interested in, in something. For example, my son, who is 13 years old, has suddenly discovered history. He's, he became a history fanatic. And suddenly he's speaking about political issues um, against racism, human rights issues. Now, I, I try not to, I mean, I speak about these things, but I, I, I believe that children should not be brainwashed into anything. I mean. But I, and I'm really surprised. So sometimes it's not necessarily because you yourself have experienced something negative or positive. That is a main motivator. But there could be other reasons. Sometimes it could be art, music. Sometimes it could be your friends. You join an organization because your friends are a member of an organization. Sometimes it's because you have the resources. Sometimes you don't have the resources. And that, that, that takes us back to what Maria was saying. Thanks. So just to add to what you're saying, um, kind of to sum it up, in order to be somehow effective and create an impact, one doesn't really have to be a youth activist, but needs to be involved within the community, knows what's happening, and not just um, sit back and things um, wait for things to to develop on their own um, it all boils down to active citizenship in reality which um, results in activism and changes within our society am i right i mean this is just an idea um to sum up what you guys are saying um antonella michael and maria have referred to you and i would like to address this question to you um, uh, we have Roxanne here with us in the room. Hello, Roxanne. And uh, she is asking if our society is giving the space for young people to actually express their voices. And uh, to do that, I would like as well uh, to add one question. In your opinion, how can we um, advance or develop youth activism i mean i know you may be new to the scene but this doesn't mean that you don't have fresh ideas or a better um, way on how to approach the development of youth activism um i i believe that there is a lot of room for youth activism to improve. Um, I think that one of the main issues is that a lot of young people feel like their voices don't matter. Like a lot of young people feel kind of helpless because most of the time if they start speaking, adults will kind of say, okay, but you haven't lived enough, you don't know enough. Um, and that can really make you feel helpless and kind of decide that it's better to just, you know, not say anything in the first place. And I think, although this is improving a bit, it is still felt. I, through um, 
different works that I've done and even with different organizations, it's, it's not the first time where we've talked to a politician or, you know, someone who has a bit more power, supposedly, and, you know, they you, you're telling them your ideas and they're looking and they're smiling and they're saying, yes, yes, it's a good idea. We'll think about it. And then they don't do anything. And sometimes you can, you know, feel the condescending tone. Um, so I think that does kind of put you down a bit. But at at the same time, I feel like social media with all its its cons as well, it has given young people an advantage because, you know, especially with young people, everyone tries to follow each other. And there is this kind of thing of, you know, wanting more followers and, and that can help because sometimes you share a post and that post gets shared by a hundred other people. And then everyone starts sharing the post and it brings more awareness. And you know, as Michael was saying as well, sometimes you could join an organization just because your friend joined and that helps. Yeah, you were you going to say something? Antonella, do you think that young, yes, because um, you mentioned that young people uh, share what youth activists are, are sharing, so on and so forth. But do you think that young people are really digging into the subject which is being tackled or are they just sharing what they're scrolling on um, just to be part of what is actually happening? Don't you think that maybe um, uh, there's lack of information um, which does not really give power to activism? Because as we mentioned earlier, you need to be informed in order to be uh, working towards what you have close to your heart. Do you think that lack of information and maybe a hint of fear play a role into this kind of behavior? I definitely think that it plays a role. I mean, one of the issues with social media is that you're so constantly bombarded with information that you just never even know whether what you're reading is true or not. And it gets confusing because even me, for example, I, I would want to share something and I, I always feel the need to do some sort of research before because it, you you always question it, whether it's actually true, whether it's not even statistics can lie sometimes. So it's, you know, with social media, you get all this information, which is good, but at the same time, it's difficult to figure out whether it's true or not. And I think that can also pose quite an issue, but I think that it's important that, you know, even for example, if you're in an organization, then you make sure that whatever the organization shares is, you know, true and accurate and not just fake news. And hopefully that will make a difference. And I think, what should be kind of pushed forward is again that I feel also that sometimes people feel the need to know about everything, which makes it hard because there's so many subspecialities and so many topics that, you know, everyone has their own life. It's hard to keep track of everything. So I think sometimes it's good to say, okay, for example, I want to focus on sexual health and make sure you get all the right information and make sure you're sharing that properly than trying to like share a bit of everything and then I end up sharing some false information or you know, things like that. So I think that's also important. But I think also that, you know, activism can be fueled a lot from seeing different people's life experiences and, and things like that. So I think that something that's important is talking to people, just making sure that you're talking to people coming from a different cultural background, coming from very a very different history to yours, you know, and you can start learning from them and, and discovering different opinions that you might have never thought about. And that will really help because I think activism is just a lifestyle. I feel like it, you either choose to be passive or you choose to be active and that's it. That's all there is to it. So I think that, you know, from just your everyday experiences, talking to people and then making sure that from then on, for example, with conversations with other people, you include that and you include your new opinions, that's enough as well. And that will make a difference. Steve, I'm going to pass the ball to you because we've got a question um, specifically addressed uh, for you. Maria Kusayar has asked, what challenges have you faced um, getting people to listen to you as a 
youth activist and mainly at times standing on your own. How how um, do you get people to listen to you? And maybe you can also indicate what worked and what not. Um, does it work speaking through emotions or is it better taking a logical approach? Well, in, in, in my case, as, as a local councillor, even due to the fact that I am an independent councillor in my, in my town, I, I, I never had the, the party platform to, to bring up my ideas and, and, and share what I think um, with, 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 with a party platform. And so I, I don't have the, the opportunities to use the radio or the television stations as, as other um, candidates or, or politicians would use their own, their own party channels. But it also, it also gave me an opportunity as an independent councillor to be more adventurous and, and liberal, so to say, in what I say and, and how I say it. And that gave me um, a sort of advantage to, to express myself in a more free way. And it also gave the opportunity even to independent media and to pick up on, on what I say. So in, in that regard, when I speak about environmental issues or about things that are happening in my locality, um, I, I feel that I am listened to. And people look at it um, uh, from a sense that, listen, since Steve is talking about it, then it, 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 it must be something of, of, of importance. So let me stop and, and see what he's saying. Obviously, that, that obviously puts a lot of pressure because, as Antonella said, it's, 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 it's very important to verify what you are speaking about. And sometimes finding access to information is very hard. Things aren't as transparent as one would always hope they are. Communication with some entities and, and, and even government departments is, is, is not as open as you would hope for. So obviously, those are, are, are boundaries. Another way I, I, I work in getting people to to stop and listen. For example, in, in, in my case, our, our village of, of Hazel Bush, we have a very active resident group on social media. We have a population of around 12,000 people and we have 8,000 residents. They are in this group. And it's quite a high percentage when you compare with other resident groups of larger localities. Usually you find much less people. So people in general here are, are very interested and there is a sense of belonging. You have the more traditional people that are more close, as Michael said, to the band clubs and to village life. And you also have residents that have just moved into the village. They have bought a new property on the, on the perimeter. And they are also interested a lot. And I use that group a lot to communicate with residents. And, and, and the residents appreciate. And they, and, and they stop, they listen, they give you their feedback. And, and that is also very encouraging. I, I, oh, I, I, as you're saying, you kind of have 8,000 activists in the boot because they're currently listening and even sharing feedback, yes, no? They, they, they are very vocal. So if, if someone wants to bring up an issue or a problem, they usually use the group and, and they write and they get the message across. And I try to be very transparent in, in what I do. So even if I am working on something, I may not have used my personal Facebook profile to, to write about it, but I would have used this Facebook group to channel my, my energy to where it counts and where I know it's going to affect the people that I am interested in. And that is very important because sometimes, as we already discussed, when you just write randomly, in this case on, on Facebook or other social media platforms, your message can, can get lost. So it's very important to focus your energy on, on, on the issues that, that matter most. Regarding emotions, this also happens sometimes. We see it a lot on Facebook when, when people write instantly with the emotions that, 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 they have, that they are thinking about. And uh, Facebook as a platform, whatever, whatever you write, even if you decide to remove it, it is going to stay there forever. So it's very important that you try to control your emotions and, and try to use reason and diplomacy as much as possible. Obviously, it doesn't always work, but it is very important. And in my case, as a politician on a local level, I, I don't like calling myself a politician, but as a local councillor, you are regarded as a politician in, in local, local government. It's, it's very important that you always write with, with responsibility, because obviously what you write will have a reaction, both positive and also negative. But in reality, I think responsibility comes in everything 
we experience in life. So it doesn't really have to be uh, a politician or someone who holds um, a high status in, in the community. I mean, we as citizens of Europe should be responsible enough, I mean, to speak up. And as you said, the people within your community are doing provide feedback and suggestions as well. Because, I mean, it, it doesn't take one to tango, right? Um, earlier, we mentioned fear. And uh, this is something which, which cropped to my mind whilst we are talking. And myself, being a youth worker, um, I do think of how young people feel when, when they are involved um, in particular initiatives. And uh, I would like to ask Maria, because I think Maria um, w has worked a lot with young people as well, and she has a lot of experience with young people. Maria, how do you think um, young activists can protect themselves themselves, sorry, against forces that want to silence them. Um, this is not just a concern of mine, but most of the youth workers I work with, uh, we, we do discuss this matter, and even people uh, who, are, who are here with us in the room have brought this up. What do you think, Mar? Is Maria still here? I think she's yeah, on mute. For a second, I think my internet connection went. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Did you hear what, what my concern what was about? I did, and it, it's, it's a really interesting question as well. Um, I mean, because when you're young, you're somehow considered as vulnerable, you know, and you do come across situations when one takes tries to take advantage of the situation and somehow these circumstances do limit the young people to grow in activism well, what's what's your idea about this i i think there there are so many different facets to this um and and i mean obviously it was it was really interesting actually michael was talking about last year and and one of the protests that took place was was the black lives matters protest which for me of the protests that i personally have organized that was the turnout was quite mind blowing alia on this issue but obviously it reflected um a, a, a global shift so we can talk about whether or not you know what the long-term impacts of this will, will be that's another conversation but um but I, I think there was an element of fearlessness on 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 that day um for me it was really interesting to see um persons of color Maltese and non-Maltese coming together um so the vast majority of asylum seekers and refugees in Malta arrived when they were young many of them are older today that have been here you know a couple of decades but but when they make that journey they tend to be in their late teens and 20s this is something that is rarely acknowledged um so when we're talking about asylum seekers we're generally talking about young people um many of them minors actually as well and and they experience fear every day um uh, on and on many many different levels and i think this points to the issue of advocacy that i was speaking to before. Um, I think Malta is a micro state. Um, it is that sort of constant feeling of, of being watched and everybody knowing everybody else also plays into this fear for, for, the, for the general population and young people tend to hold less power in society, which so it, it, it also exposes them. Um, it could be that they take a stand um, on an issue today and tomorrow they um, are in the same room with, a, with an individual that they were taking a stand against and, and they feel vulnerable. Let me speak about it from a youth worker's perspective. Um, I, 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 I certainly think I, I described a process earlier on um and and i and i think it was antonella who said you know activism isn't something that everyone should do and and should feel ad, ad, obliged to do and they certainly can't get involved with everything because there just aren't enough hours in the day um but but i think as a youth worker i would be working with individuals 
um, to find their way to exercise voice in the way they feel safest to do so. Um, and if we speak about empower, empowerment, I try to avoid the, the term, honestly, it's used as a buzzword, it's thrown into every policy document you have. Um, and it's so very empty. Um, the, the, there is a fine line between protecting and, 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 and molly cuddling, if, if, if you like. Um, I do not want to speak on behalf of anybody. I would much rather be in a situation where I am supporting people and, 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 and that they have a platform to, to give voice. And, and I think this is, this is the, 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 the journey that we need to navigate. Um, supporting can be done in many different ways, emotional support, psychological support, material support, my support as an educator in the sense of creating a space to learn, which again points to what Antonella was saying and what Steve was saying and Michael, actually everybody's spoken about this, the need to be informed. I mean, that is your probably one of the most in, important things. Um, knowledge is power, no? Um, and so it's not just about how the, the information that you hold, but also how you articulate that information, how you get your message out there. So there is much that we can do to work with young people to address these fears, but not to dismiss those fears um, and uh, to take those fears very, very seriously and respect them. Thank you, Maria. Quite deep. I mean, you got me hooked on literally, listen, not that I'm not following what's happening, but what you just said really struck me and being a youth worker um, kind of got me thinking and with, it, it definitely leads to reflection. Um, Michael, you have been involved in activism quite for a long time. Um, so I think I should ask you if you have seen an increase in activism since Malta joined the European Union. Can you somehow see any difference before uh, Malta joined the EU and now that we are quite involved um, um, uh, within the European Union? If yes, is this a sign that the European initiatives to promote democratic participation are working? And if not, why do you think this is the case? Well, this is Sh a very should we section question. the question? Yes, <laughs> I, I actually researched this for my PhD, which was on environmental NGOs and whether uh, or how the EU, how, how well does EU accession impact? I researched them, that as well. <laughs> or whether it impacted them at all? It's there's no black or white answer. I think generally yes, the EU had a, had an impact, but the impact was uneven. It depends on which sector you're speaking about, which organization, which field, and so forth. First of all, let's be clear, before we joined the EU, we, 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 there was activism in Malta. Now, um, there were different, some NGOs, for example, some environmental NGOs have been around since the 1960s. You have some activists, for example, household names like Pepe Azzopardi were active in the 1980s in organizations like Tan Numri. They were speaking up on, on, on certain, and they used culture and art for, to, to, you know, they were very creative. Um, the environment, I mean, I, I cannot but rem remind us of the memory of my friend who had passed away, Giulio Manduca. I remember when I was a kid, seeing him being active in the environmental field. This was back in the 1980s and 90s, before we joined the EU. But the EU has, has had an impact as well. I mean, for example, I mentioned bird life earlier on. Um, bird life you, uses, and rightly so, the EU as a platform to, to voice its concerns on hunting. So do the hunters, they, and, and the other way around. However, they, of course, they disagree with each other. So even though hunting is very much of a national issue, in fact, we had a referendum on it, it's very much impacted by EU legislation. So there is this interaction between the, the, the national and the European, and that gives a platform to, to NGOs like BirdLife. But on the other hand, if you mention Movement Graffiti, which is very much in the news nowadays, this seems to be the, the graffiti wave right now, because we, we tend to see a lot of waves in, in activism. Now, graffiti has been around for over 25 years, but I think right now it's like the graffiti moment. The gra graffiti, I don't think the EU has had much of an impact on graffiti's activism. 
I, not, not, not even in my research, what, that was one of my findings. Um, uh, graffiti is active dis despite Malta's EU accession. So it depends what, what issue we're speaking about and what legislation we're speaking about. Then there are issues where the EU plays an important role, but sometimes it could be very, you know, disappointing or it depends on how you look at it. Look at the migration issue. The EU is constantly agreeing to disagree. It's a very difficult issue. Uh, yeah, but I mean, you know, people are dying at sea. Um, uh, but I don't think we can simply say that the EU was the main source of, in of increased activism. Surely there is more activism nowadays, at least visibly. But in the past, you know, perhaps there was more trade union activism than there is right now. Um, then again, le the level of education has increased. That means that again can, can, can impact people's decision to become an activist. Usually, for example, in the environmental movement, many activists come from an educated middle class background. So that is something else which has an impact. Grievances can have an impact. What is a grievance? A grievance is something which affects you. Now, given that Malta is basically a glorified building site, we have construction going on everywhere. We have perhaps an increase in local activism. Now, some call it NIMBY activism, not in my backyard activism. But, you know, I mean, nobody would like to spend the whole day hearing a crane or hear, hearing, you know, a, a mixer or, and so forth. So sometimes there is activism which has increased, but it, which has nothing to do with Malta's EU accession. A lot of our environmental activism actually isn't really much related to Malta's EU accession. I'm not referring to hunting but a lot of activism which has got to do with overdevelopment. Well, one can say it is, <laughs> there is a link because uh, paradoxically, a lot of funds which we get for our roads comes, come from the EU. <laughs> That's quite a paradox actually, um, because the EU is usually seen as, as, an, uh, as a force which is pro-environment usually. But um, the democratization of Malta, I mean, our democracy has a lot of defects as Maria said, but. At the end of the day, we are a democracy. It's not like you go out to protest and police come out beating you. We're not in Belarus or in, you know, or in some other country. So that is what sociologists refer to as an opportunity structure. Perhaps some people are afraid to protest, and I get that fully. But it's different, you know, having people uh, say gossip against you than having, you know, a policeman coming up, coming and beating you up. Then again, it depends on who we are talking about, because if we are referring to the protests by irregular migrants, they are actually paraded in front of court when, and that is something shameful in my opinion. I mean, as I said, I collect, I do most of my research on the media, on protests, and you see how different people are treated in a different way. When, when, when irregular migrants held protests, you know, to, to just to have a basic human conditions in, in the places where, where they are kept. Some of them were paraded in front of court, you know, as if they they they, they are mass murderers or something, and that that is quite quite tragic. So there there are a lot of aspects when it comes to the EU. It's not only the legal aspect, however. There's also soft what some sociologists refer to as soft power. So, for example, when Malta introduced divorce, in in reality, the EU had no legal remit. On this, just as the abortion issue, the EU has no legal remit on abortion. But the fact that we are EU members, um, in a way, some some sociologists and and political scientists and anthropologists argue that there is this form of soft power, this globalization of cultural values, um, uh, which you know the EU doesn't have a direct impact there. But given that we are EU members, perhaps we have. Some of us perhaps have a greater expectation to change things in some way. Values change in a society, even Catholicism changes. The Catholicism of today isn't exactly the same Catholicism of 50 years ago. For example, in Germany right now, you have priests who are actually um, uh, holding marriages amongst LGBTIQ people. They are protesting against the Vatican in a way. So, so Michael, what, you, what you're saying, sorry, yeah. what you're saying, does it relate to current trends as in like you can see uh, an increase in activism at this point in time in 2021 and then there would be a decline in 2023 for example because there's nothing really actually happening so it's like a ripple effect am i right or 
Yes, the, the, there are cycles of, of protests and cycles of activism. However, there, sometimes there, there's a direct reason why people protest. For example, when, when Daphne Caruana Galizia was murdered, that encouraged many people to go out on the streets. Then again, many of them were active, particularly within a particular political party. We have to say that as well. We, we shouldn't be naive. Um, but like everyone else, everyone has the right to protest. I mean, I think party politics is something which one has to look into whether one likes it or not when we discuss activism in Malta. Many activists have party political affiliations. Then again, not everyone who is, a, who is affiliated with a political party looks at things like that. There are people who actually deliberate, sometimes behind the scenes. Um, but sometimes it's not because people do not necessarily protest because things are bad. For example, the decade of, which is usually mentioned as the decade of protest in the world was the 1960s. Now, there were reasons why people were protested, like the Vietnam War, racism, and so forth. But it was also a time of increased affluence. People had more money in their pockets. People had more free time to protest. So that is why perhaps you see more protests in Germany than you see in North Korea, for example. So we have to contextualize things. I think you can never carry out an analysis and simply look at one factor. There are so many factors. Some are structural, some are have to do with, with the individual. There are so many facets of, of, of activism, as Maria was saying, after all. Yeah. You literally gave us a, a clear picture and showed us as well a lot of aspects um, of activism and how it, it is actually affected. Um, that is, that we can see an increase and a decline um, in the involvement of, of particular people within the societies working towards change. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not on my own representing Agencia Zaza here. I've got my colleague Maria, um, who's been sitting backstage, still working very effectively. So, uh, a good example as well um, of how youth activism works. Um, uh, Maria has been taking care of the interaction between us and the people watching us online as well, and the people being here in the room with us. Hello, Maria. Hi. So, was a really we... lovely conversation to follow. Indeed, I agree. I agree. Um, uh, Maria, can you maybe provide us with some uh, some questions or concerns um, that the people where we were following us uh, brought forward? Yes, indeed. So we have Angela Bettoni who's asking, "What's the difference between being an advocate?" and an activist, um, if, if there is one at all. Um, I'm think sorry to interrupt, Maria, but if the panel would like to um, take up any concern or question brought forward, please feel free. I mean, this is a place where we um, dialogue and where we share our views and thoughts. Um, there's question two, which is, has been presented by George Farooja. I believe we already started um, speaking about this, and that's how partisan politics affect the level of activism in Malta, which is also very interesting. And the third one, again by George Farooja, he's asking about, um, specifically about a comment by Andre Callus from Movement Graffiti, who stated people in Malta are still mostly reluctant to take to the streets. And he's asking, is it maybe because activists tend to become labeled or maybe due to the apathy, which uh, Maria mentioned earlier? So- Okay, I mean, now, we, can, I we can take this up. Um, I mean, we, we cannot speak on behalf of Andre Kalus, but we can reflect on what he has said, uh, definitely. And we say uh, hello to Andre as well, who has been quite um, involved in, in activism here in Malta and took the activism a step forward. Maria, do you mind if you ref, um, repeat what George said, please? So on the one hand, he's asked um, how the dynamic of party politics affects activism in Malta. Um, and uh, secondly, he asked uh, whether this reluctance to take to the street is related to activists becoming labelled or to apathy. The floor is yours, Michael. Okay. So I, I really like these questions. On party politics, 
well, I've been active in both. I've seen things from the inside both ways. And I've seen some nice things and I've seen some things which are less nice. Definitely political parties try to gobble up NGOs. Definitely. I mean, it's a, a, not only in Malta, you, you find this everywhere. And as Antonella said, it's very common to find politicians who nod their head and they don't exactly know what you are speaking to them about. But then there are others who do listen to, to act. And there are many politicians who actually were activists themselves. So we have to, you know, it's not a black or white picture. Now, I, I think this is, this is like a symbiotic relationship. NGOs and, and voluntary organizations ideally should be autonomous from political parties. But I can tell you from my experience and even from my research that there are very, very few organizations which are autonomous from political parties. Now, is this bad or is this good? It depends on how you look at it. If you want to bring out change, through the law, you need the political parties. So for example, right now, the abortion issue, the, 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 org, the new organizations which, which have cropped up, the pro-choice organizations, and even the pro-life organizations, because that is how they define themselves, they lobby with political parties. So they, they ultimately, they try to capture the attention of politicians. And I, I am one of those who believes, not everyone agrees with me, but my research, I have shown this through some research, perhaps this doesn't apply to all issues, but various issues which were successful in Malta, civil society issues, often managed to capture the support either of a major political party or else of exponents of both major political parties, whether they are local environmental issues, whether they are civil rights issues. Now, this doesn't apply across the board, okay? So I think political parties and NGOs need each other both ways, but they, they, they are also distinct, but they cannot live without each other. It, you know, it's like a love-hate relationship. It's, it's very complex, but I, I really would, it, I really suggest that when we analyze these things, you, sim you simply cannot analyze civil society in Malta and ignore political parties, because political parties are everywhere in Malta. I mean, one can go back to the writings of Jeremy Bosevan, the great Dutch anthropologist who spent 60 years living in Malta and he really understood multi-society well. On reluctance, I am not so, on, on lack of people protesting, I am not so pessimistic. I actually, I'm quite optimistic. Last year, in the year of COVID, Malta had 74 protests on the street, which is quite a lot. In the year of COVID, including, I, I, count, I actually counted them and I, I presented them. Um, uh, some were not on the streets, some were on boats as well, okay? And in detention centers. Um, but we had 74 protests. In December 2019, we had a whole month of protests. Now, most people came from the same demograph, most people came from the same political background, but that was a lot. Per capita, if you look at how many people protest in Malta, we have a lot of protests. I mean, yesterday there was a protest in Germany, I think in front of, I think it was in Germany, in front of the embassy of Belarus, and they said hundreds protest. In Malta, it's common nowadays that hundreds protest. 30 years ago, you would have six people protesting or, or, or four people. You'd have, you know, Pepe Azzopardi, Julian Manduk and some others. Then there were others who, who, who took their place and so forth. But, you know, more, I, I think, I, I think protest has become part of, of our political um, uh, background, if you, part of our political context. I, I'm not so pessimistic on, on protest. Then again, there are people, and this, this is something which we have to analyze, who prefer, now this can be something both positive and negative, who prefer to speak to their local politician for, for some grievance which they have. Now, sometimes this can lead to patronage, it could lead to corruption. I mean, I'm not referring to necessarily to now, I mean, to many years, okay? Um, but on the other hand, there, it, there, there is a positive aspect as well that politicians are so close to you. If you have a local councillor who, who has the environment at heart, like Steve, for example, you, you, can, you can express your grievances to your local councillor in a way that you cannot do perhaps in bigger countries. So the proximity of politicians to people in Malta is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it can lead to, you know, a lot of behind the scenes networking to get a permit, for example, to do this and to do that. On the other hand, it can also help sensitize politicians. And something else which I wanted to add, again, it's not something which I like saying, but it, it's something which I observe a lot. Even though there are many people who protest on the environment, and I am one of those, I mean, I've been active 
since time immemorial on the environment, there are many people who, who perhaps are not protesting in favor of the environment because they, they are making money by selling their properties. And let's make it very clear. Not all property developers are the big businessmen whom we hear. Many people are involved in the property sector. People who build an extra story and rent it out as Airbnb. I'm not saying it's wrong or, or it's right, but I'm saying we have to understand, as Max Weber once said, Verstehen in German, to understand. Just as there are many people who are against the chopping of trees and against the Central Link project, I am one of those who criticize the Central Link project, there are others who favor such development because they can use their car more. Now, is this, you know, I'm sure Steve can speak better than me on this. Is this sustainable or not? I don't think it is sustainable. But I think it's very important that activists listen to voices even which they disagree with. Because if you want to bring about change, ultimately, change comes from society and society comes from people. So dialogue is very important. Dialogue doesn't mean selling out. It doesn't mean, it can, you can sell out sometimes, but, but it also means that you can learn and perhaps you can articulate your own discourse in a way which resonates more. When we had the front against the golf course, we, we dialogued a lot with farmers, but I think the church played a very, very important role. Luckily, that time the um, university chaplaincy was led by a priest who was very much into environmental issues, Father Jimmy, who, who, whom I salute from here, and Father Pierre Margaret, who passed away. I salute him as well. These, the, these two priests sensitize the whole religious community. Now, back then, I and others, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a churchgoer myself, I'm not really interested in religious matters, but we learned that through dialogue, through dialogue, you can, you can move things. And I think what Steve said earlier on, that as a local councillor, you have to listen to different voices and you learn. You, as a local councillor, you learn as much as you give. I mean, I, I can say that because I was a local councillor myself. You learn, you learn about people's concerns. Before I was a local councillor, I never thought that pavements were so important for people. Now I think pavements are one of the most important issues in Malta. So many elderly people and persons with disability don't go out because of pavements, because they are afraid that they will, they will trip in a pavement which has been broken due, due to a construction project and it was never fixed. So, well, I, I, I'm more on the optimistic side of things. Let's put it this way. Okay. I don't mind to interrupt you, Michael, because I mean, what you're saying does make sense, um, even though there are things which we might not agree on. But then again, as you're saying, dialogue is the best key uh, for change. Maria, are there any other questions um, that were addressed to us? I mean, we're running a bit out of time. We're getting close to the end of this session, but I would like to hear what the, um, the audience had to say. Basically, one final question, and the, who, there's a young person, Naomi, who asked, what happens when you change your opinion and how does it affect your public image? And I think we can close with that one. Very, very interesting question. Who's going to answer, um, Naomi? I can answer and then I mean, yeah, others have a lot to say as well on it, but this is something that personally um, I think about a lot because I feel like especially in a small country like Malta, when you outwardly voice an opinion, it's like everyone knows it now and everyone has put this label on you as having that opinion and being in favor of that thing. And so then, you know, changing that seems like the most terrifying thing in the world. Um, however, I think it's really important to understand that, you know, we've been saying about how activism comes in waves, everything changes, and, you know, as a person, we need to grow. We're constantly changing, we're constantly growing, so that automatically means that our opinions are going to change and what we stand for is going to change, and that, in my opinion, is something that is good because it's a sign that you're learning and you're growing and you're not just stuck on one thing. So. I think that it's really important to accept that fact. And also, I think as long as you give an explanation as to why something changed, why an opinion changed, that's all that matters. Because, you know, one day you can realize that something you've been standing for or an organization that you've been with is 
actually corrupt or actually not what it seemed. So I think kind of bringing that to light and talking about how you realize that you wanted to change your opinion and focusing on that can be really fruitful as well and, you know, help motivate other people to not be afraid to voice their opinions and not be afraid to change those opinions. Because I really think that, you know, I mean, also, we're so quick to criticize society and talk about all these things that we hate about society. But at the end of the day, it's an important realization to make that we are society. So it's important to start changing that ourselves through our individual actions. And, you know, we're learning and growing along the way. So it's just an, a beautiful, important process, I think. Anyone would like to add something to what um, Antonella has just said? Go ahead, Steve. To add on to what, to what Antonella said, sometimes you, you may not change your opinion about the subject, but through personal experiences, you may, you may learn to change the approach you take to reach your goal. Sometimes you may have had uh, an impression, an idea of how you want to achieve your aims, and then you experience something and you say, listen, I think I need to change my approach. I need to change what I am saying or how I am saying it or to who I am saying it. And that also can lead to people, you know, asking as far as something happened, uh, you have been labeled in one way. Now, it, and it wouldn't be that you would have changed what you believe in, but you would change your, 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 your approach. And I think that is very important that as, as Michael said also, and that, that we always have to listen and engage in dialogue. And that all, always, brings us closer to people with different perspectives and different personal experiences. The, the issue, for example, of hunting and, and, and bird shooting and bird conservation is a very good example. I, I am very fond of bird watching, and for example, and I am always encountering hunters, because obviously when you are out bird watching, there are people out hunting, and you may have an opinion on, on something, and, and the hunter has an opinion on another thing, but you'll be impressed that sometimes, although you may not agree on everything, that there is common ground on, on, on where someone, uh, we can both work together. That is very interesting. So sometimes changing your approach or opening it up instead of narrowing it can bring further success to your cause. Thank you very much, Steve. I don't know if Michael or Maria would like to add to what has been said. If not, I've got one of those cliche questions to, to address to you. Uh, Maria or Michael, would you like to add something to what has just been said? No. Okay. So let's move on to this cliche uh, question. Um, uh, what advice would you give to those who wish to be active but don't know where to start? Because this is one of uh, one of the most common questions um, which young people come up with. But where do I start? How does this whole, whole thing come to life? Maybe I can I can respond also in relation to 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 what um, the others said before me. I think ultimately politics isn't a thing; it's a process. Um, it is ongoing, and and so our ideas are constantly shifting. You know, as 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 contexts and realities change. It's also a relational practice, just like youth work. I mean, ultimately, it is about relationships. Um, and, and none of us is, is an island. And Malta is not an island, really, in the sense that we are completely interdependent, which means that we have to engage in conversations with people we might not necessarily agree with. I mean, that's absolutely intrinsic to the process. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense at all. Um, and, and perhaps to, to respond to, to your question, I, I think that's it, Sarah. It's about relationships. So see what in, see what interests you. Reach out to people who, if you may not, I mean, especially in Malta, you may not know somebody involved, but you will certainly know somebody who knows somebody involved. Um, I mean, that's not six degrees of separation, it's one degree in Malta. So it's actually quite easy to, to, to speak to someone, whether it's a teacher or, or, or a priest or, or a, a youth worker um, or your local counselor. They, they, our relationships are perhaps um, some of our, it's an incredibly, it's an incredibly important resource. Um, so use those relationships and uh, to reach out to those people or those people that are engaged in issues that you might um, be interested in. And then I would just say, enjoy the journey. 
um, and engage in, in the way that is best for you um, without feeling any sense, I think, of, of, of obligation. Uh, this isn't a case of you should be doing this or you should be doing that. Um, that's part of the learning process. It's a very individual thing, or an individual thing, but like I said, related to, to, to our broader relationships with each other locally um, and internationally. And, and as I've said earlier, which is related to, to many of the issues that were said, not just with human beings, but with the non-human too. Anyone else? I'd just like to add something else. I, I think I, I fully agree that you have to follow your passion. And it can come, as we said earlier, from music. It could come from sports. For example, in football today, there's so much advocacy against racism. That, that's something really uh, we should be proud of that. that. That in the footballing world, which is so much, you know, we speak about how commercialized it has become, which is true. But at the same time, there's this advocacy against racism, which is which is great. I, uh, something, I, I find a parallel with what we were saying, with, with something which I discovered as a parent just a few months ago. So my son is going to start Form 3 next year, and he had to choose his subjects, and there's this approach called My Journey, which I, I, I found fascinating. I mean, when I was a kid, we have practically could choose just boring subjects. Now there's this My Journey approach. I'm not here to, to publicize some. But I saw it in my son's face. He was seeing the subjects and he was seeing the presentations of different. And when he saw the history presentation, he got so excited, like, this is what I want to do. And he's, I, it's incredible. No, I, I think the same can be done as regards activism. If there is an, an issue which you really feel strongly about, whatever it is, it could be, you know, watching birds, it could be, showing solidarity for people who are drowning in the sea. You know, it could be international help, whatever. It, there are so many issues. So I think we should look closer to ourselves. What really interests us? If there is something which interests us, believe me, there is either an organization which is active in that field. There are so many organizations. It's not only the 10 organizations which we read about in the press and good luck to them because that shows that they know how to publicize themselves. But there are so many other organizations in so many areas in Malta. I think our ecosystem of, of civil society is really, really rich in Malta. But my, that, that is all I, I want to you know, appeal to. Follow your passion, follow the, the, the areas which interest you. And there's, you shouldn't be ashamed of your passions. I mean, I think the LGBTIQ issue in the past years has really shown us that we can really change things fast. I remember the first time I lectured, and probably Maria can, can, can relate to this as well. The first time I mentioned LGBTIQ to students, many students were not aware of many issues. I don't blame them. Today, it's a mainstream issue. It's, it's all over the place. And this issue really came from civil society. It was a civil society issue. So hats off to the activists who, who stood up to be counted. And, 20 and years ago was the first where no one would turn up. I mean, we would yeah. be handfuls at the beginning. Yeah. Gay pride Indeed. was such a small affair in yeah. the beginning. Exactly. Stephen Antonella, would you like to share some words with us before we close this session? Um, basically, I agree with what everyone's been saying. I really think that, you know, activism at its root is just all about passionate, what you're passionate about, you know, and that's all that's important. And I think in reality as well, people can sense when you're just genuinely advocating for something, when you're genuinely just working for something because you're passionate about it, and that will bring, you know, a good change along with it. And I, I you know, I, there are a lot of moments where if you're especially involved in activism, you can feel really burnt out and it can feel really draining and, and useless sometimes, but it's not because even just the fact that true activism, you can meet so many new people, you can learn so much and have so many connections that will be important for you for the rest of your life. You know, it's something that's really special. And I think that, you know, everyone can be active in whatever way they want and we're all working to improve our society. So as long as we just keep doing that together, that's all that matters. Thank you very much, Antonella. Steve? Well, I don't have a lot more to say, just maybe a small note. We, we as a society, we live, we live in a, a direct democracy in which we are given the opportunity to vote 
every four or five years. But we should never stop at just voting. We have the opportunity to raise um, issues that, 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 that we believe in at any time. You know? So for example, me as a local councillor, we have local council elections every five years. The next local council election is in three years time. We are in our third year you now. If someone has an issue or is passionate about something and wants to raise it, they can just raise it now. So we should never um, stop and, and be silent. To, to, to bring to bring the change that we want to see. There's there's so much work left to do, you know. If we pull in and then bring out our potential, we can we can move mountains. Thank you, Steve. And I do not just want to thank you, the panelists, for being part of this uh, initiative, Youth Activism in Malta. But I would also like to say a special thanks to Maria, my colleague, who has been with me from the very first page of this journey and making it, um, in my opinion, a successful initiative uh, in collaboration with the European Youth Card Association towards the Conference of, Fut of the Future of Europe. But above all, I would like to thank um, the young people who have been involved um, and enthusiastic uh, towards this initiative, Youth Activism in Malta. And in my opinion, this reflects um, that there might be an increase in activism, seeing how many young people wanted to be part of this initiative. Um, may I conclude this session, not just by saying thank you, but also to encourage you, uh, the audience who are following us and even the young people who are here with us, to do take a stand for something. Because as Maria Pisani earlier said, if you don't take a stand for something, you will fall for everything. I wish you all a very good evening and thank you very much for being here with us. And let us keep on working towards a better Europe. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well thank done. you. Well thank done. you.